Um, this is actually a really cool panel to get to do, a, a, because I just love these guys and the work that they do. But um, it, it, it's nice to have the opportunity to actually discuss something that I think, I think for consumers of video games, there's no reason that they could understand. And I think sometimes, uh, I, I imagine many of you would like the press to sometimes be a little bit more aware of just how complicated the process of making games is. And that it, it, it's one that does take much longer than a lot of other creative efforts, and it's because there's just so many interesting aspects that go into it, and that's why games, I believe, are such a fascinating medium, and there's so much creativity in it. And so uh, well, I'm going to have an opportunity for all four of you to sort of identify yourself, your company, and kind of how your, where your company started and where it is now, just in terms of its, 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 its growth, and maybe a word on what your philosophy is, at kind of sort of running you know, that many people and trying to keep them really energized. And Matt, I'll start with you. Okay, so my name is Matt Hooper, and I'm... Uh now a project director at id software and i've been there for about 10 years and a lot of people have heard of id software and it's actually this year was the 20th anniversary so that's a long time 1991 that's a very long time i've known those guys for about 15 years and i'm talking about the uh the carmax and even the romeros and i'm not sure if he's here today but just go way back with them and um for us it's probably a different journey than these other guys but it started from the garage band days that kind of um, when, when PCs first started coming online and uh, you know, people started investigating games and, and it was literally three or four guys, maybe not in a garage, but in a one-bedroom apartment. Um, so it goes from, from way back you know, in those early days to you know, the, the, the revolution of the Internet to, to all the way to the, to the new consoles and everybody being connected to now we're 20 years later and we're near 200 people. So you can imagine the the, uh, the changes in production philosophies and and uh, you know the, the fact that we have ten plus producers uh, when it used to be three guys in an apartment just tremendous amount of change and I, I think the biggest thing that I've come to learn and, and then we kind of follow this philosophy is the greatest things that id software does today are still the same you know happen for the same reasons as they did twenty years ago it's about putting little groups of talented people together. Um, you know, you can like-minded or whatever, just creative individuals, put them in these little groups and let them do stuff. That's one of my jobs as a leader is to, is to notice that and let it happen because you could easily get in the way of progress. And again, it started there and we're still kind of learning that lesson over and over again. Uh, so our philosophy kind of sticks on that. It's a, we're still a garage band. Somebody actually was trying to um, be critical of our production philosophy. This, this is kind of an inner studio uh, uh, argument we were having, and his point was, you guys are just like a garage band. That's not going to work. And it's like, that is the best, you know, criticism I could ever get. That's exactly what we're like, and that's where our successes have come from. I'm Ted Price. I'm the CEO and founder of Insomniac Games, and almost, we're almost as old as it, not quite. We're almost 18 years old. Uh, we started also in kind of the garage days, and our goal back at the very beginning was to be a console developer. And this was uh, started the company right at the time where Nintendo was the, the ruler and 3DO came along with CD-ROMs and all of a sudden made it very affordable for garage developers to get into the business on the console side. And so we began with our first game, Disruptor, on the PlayStation back in 1996. I think that's when we released it. And from there we made Spyro the Dragon, Ratchet and Clank, Resistance, and uh, now we are going multi-platform, and it's been a great ride. We've got about 220 people, two offices, and the most exciting thing for me personally is that recently we started a social division called Insomniac Click, where we are now working in a completely different market alongside our console efforts. And for us, as a company, it's been a real learning experience because we are now uh, opening our eyes to what's going on in the rest of the world in terms of the, the many, many, many millions of people who are playing social games. So we like now having our feet in both worlds. And as far as our philosophy goes, from the very beginning, uh, just like I think you alluded to, Matt, we, we've been about giving people the opportunity to be creative and just to work together in a very collaborative fashion. Because when it comes down to it, we're all about having fun. I mean, we're making fun, right? So making fun has got to be fun. And a lot of that entertainment internally comes from that excitement you get working together on hard problems and coming up with really fun, creative solutions to make cool stuff. 
So it's kind of my spiel. I'm uh, Vince Sampella from Respawn. We're obviously the new kids on the block here, only about a year and a half old. So um, before that, I mean, obviously, I've been in the industry a long time. I think it's the, we're talking all this talk of the collaboration and the the fun and the iteration. That's really, I think, what drives us, you know, on previous games and on what we're doing now at Respawn. It's it is about that collaboration. It's about making something that's fun, something that you would play so you know somebody else would play it. Because we're all, you know, the core of us, we're gamers at heart. We play games. We love games, you know, so it, I think it's in our blood. Um, you know, we've had a, kind of a start over here recently, so it's, you know, interesting to see conventions that, you know, what, what do you take with you from what you've learned in the past and what do you try to change because, you know, it's a good reset point. And a lot of that core really kind of is the same. It's, it's what, what group of people can you put together and let them go. Give them the freedom. Don't, you know, don't strictly dictate what they can and can't do. Let them explore because that's when you will get amazing work. So I think that's kind of what's, what's running us at Respawn now. <clears throat> My name is Mark Merrill. I'm the president and co-founder of Riot Games. And, uh, you know, I would really echo a lot of the sentiments that, uh, that these guys have talked about from a philosophical perspective. But just to orient everybody with a little bit of background about Riot, uh, we just had our fifth anniversary uh, this past week. And uh, our flagship game, of course, is, is League of Legends. And we're a little bit different as well in that, you know, we're both a developer as well as our own publisher. And so we have a series of uh, interesting and challenges or interesting challenges that we need to solve around servicing our, our customers directly, uh, publishing our products, operating them internationally. And so we have about 420 people now. Uh, we have four offices around the world. We're headquartered here in Santa Monica. And um, from a development perspective, we have uh, roughly you know, 230 people on the development side. The rest make up kind of publishing and service. And, uh, but in terms of you know, our, full, our core philosophy, uh, there's a couple, depending on what our perspective is that we're talking about. You know, one is our perspective around how we want to interact with our players. And our perspective there is that uh, one of the reasons we offer League of Legends for free is because uh, we want to deliver extreme amounts of value to our players. And everything that we do from a company perspective is really about servicing our players and doing a phenomenal job to deliver what they want, not necessarily what we want. Uh, but then from a development perspective, you know, in the same way that everybody talked about having small, goal-oriented teams to find fun, we think that that's by far and away the best uh, ways to accomplish our core mission around delivering great value to gamers because it's the small groups and the individuals that can come up with phenomenal ideas, and one of management's responsibility is to get out of the way and to unblock the potential that great people have. So for us, it really starts with having great talent and then helping support them to create phenomenal ideas and experiences to deliver value to players. So uh, <clears throat> I, 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 I think that the, the interesting thing, especially from, from my viewpoint coming out of the, the entertainment industry where it's more, it's TV and I've worked on, on, on movies as well, they, there you have a very regimented top-down, like almost borderline like military structure. Um, I, I think that's how people sort of assume for large projects. And you guys were talking about something that's a lot more broad-based where you really want that collaboration. Um, that's got to be sort of interesting in how you have to balance that ebb and flow where people can start to come up with ideas and then there has to be a point where if not you personally, one of your guys has to say, look, the, the tentacle physics are fine, you can't do any more with it, we have to move on. I mean, wh where, where, where's that point where you want to keep people, you know, thinking and, and getting excited but you have to, you know, you, you do have to manage, you do have to make deadlines. Ted, I'll start with you. All right. Uh, it is all about deadlines, really. I mean, because we have commitments to ourselves, to our publishers, to our fans to get the games out when we say we're going to finish them. And it is, uh, it, we, you know, we're always, I think all of us are walking that fine line between design by committee and autocracy, where you have somebody in charge who's saying, this is the way it's got to be, God damn it, do it, or you're fired. Now that's, we don't want either of those, of those extremes. And finding somewhere in the middle comes down to the personalities of your leaders and making sure that the people that you have in charge of the teams are listening, but at the same time can make decisions on a consistent, uh, in, in a consistent way. And you know, I, I don't think anybody that I've ever met uh, is perfect in that sense. I mean, certainly I've failed many times in that area. And 
I think our goal at Insomniac is to develop that type of leadership where we have leaders for teams of all sizes, whether it's an art team, uh, the actual game team, uh, technology team, that can listen but also make the decisions uh, in, a, in a quick manner. Yeah, I would say it's pretty similar. It's that most people, you're responsible first and foremost for yourself and what you're doing. There comes a point where if that stretch is too long, there's leads that can step in and say, okay, well, we need to move on. You've got only so much time you can spend on this and kind of put an end to it. And then it, you know, it can go up higher to where there's uh, the, the director on the game would say, like, okay, done, kill it here. You, know, you hope it doesn't get to that point and people can solve those problems kind of by themselves. But there are times where you know, the game director will step in and say, like, done, we're doing A for whatever reason, just to move on, hope it's the best, and you go with it. I, I think, too, a, a key to being a successful leader, and you guys have probably all learned this, because you have to get the buy-in, you have to have the trust, you have to have the respect, but that has to be earned. And I've always uh, kind of said it this way, it's about making mostly correct decisions, because you're not going to make all correct decisions. But if you get that track record, um, even if people don't agree, but you you kind of get these successes, these milestones, and um, then you, you earn the respect, basically. You earn the ability to say, that's not a good idea for these reasons, and we're going to move forward in this direction. If you're mostly correct and you do that, over time, you just earn the respect of the team. But it is difficult because, um, again, everybody has a lot of really good ideas, but we have schedule discipline. That's funny for an id guy saying that. <laughs> uh, you know, and there's publisher pressures, and, you know, we want to get the game out. Um, so decisions have to be made. And, and, and Mark, I, I think it's interesting for you because since you guys publish, um, right. you, you, you can just talk to yourself and get permission to just you know, have absolutely take longer. Right. It's, yeah, it's a little different for us, and uh, that is, you know, you know, I, I would say, generally a blessing. Uh, but it creates some interesting challenges sometimes because, uh, you know, from our perspective, what you know, oftentimes we are forced to choose between. Uh, you know, do we want to really what we deliver would deliver we think to be ideal for the players, or uh, do we want to invest additional time or resources to take another repass or do something else, or are we solving the right problem? Uh, and so, you know, it's nice to be able to sort of control our own destiny from that perspective. Um, but we also have some of the, the challenges associated with, you know, being you know not having the luxury of being able to focus solely on making you know, the most incredible game. We also have to think about the service implications. And uh, in general, though, you know, I would say that, that the way that we kind of manage the balance is that we really try to focus on our mission, which is to deliver value to players and uh, work backwards from there. And oftentimes we've, you know, been on the launch pad with something and, you know, had to throw something away because we thought it wouldn't end up being the best decision for our players. Uh, but that tends to suggest to us that there's an upstream process problem that we should go figure out and figure out how to revise our process and you know upstream from different collaboration between different disciplines to deliver better results. But it is a little different for us. Um, as, as, as Matt so kindly pointed out, there's, there's quite a bit of diversity here in terms of schedules on, 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 on games. Vince, I was going to start with you. I mean, obviously, you, you've done quite a few on the two-year cycle where there, where there, there was that downtime. When you have something that, that is that narrow, how, how long is that creative process at the beginning where you start to flush out the ideas and what the ambitions are? And then do, do, does, does it kind of drop dead and people just start to make the game? Or do those two things coexist at the same time? A little of both. I mean, there's, depends on the game, I guess. It's, you know, you kind of, you know you have a certain amount of time at the beginning that you're going to spend on, you know, throw out ideas, let everyone on the team throw out ideas, like, you know, kind of floors open. What do, what do you suggest? Uh, and then you kind of whittle them down from there because, you know, you realize 90% of them just won't work for whatever reason or another. And then you start to focus down on ideas and then some of them don't work and you realize, you know, as you're building them, why? And you either change them or you throw them out. And then you're left with, you know, hopefully a good, a good batch of ideas that you can put together in a game. And then it doesn't actually come together until, like, the end. Now, are, are, are you guys still working with the uh, documents that kind of are, are, are that Bible? There's a whole lot, let's, you know, let's re re refer back to that, or is it still more fluid than, than, than it used to be for, for a lot of teams? Um, we're kind of in the figuring all that out phase, so I don't know. You know <laughs> yeah, next year, we'll, we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. Now, Ted, uh, I mean, you, you've, you've also worked on that two-year cycle. I think with Resistance, that might be one of the first games in 
quite some time where you, 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 you had a whole extra year. I mean, was, was there something you, you, you learned from that and that, you know? We did. We actually yeah. learned a pretty tough lesson. Uh, we learned that you're basically never done. I mean, that's what it came down to. We actually gave ourselves an additional year because we thought, okay, we're going to get done with production. After two years, I'm looking at Corey over here, knows this well. And it's going to be uh, smooth sailing from there because all we're going to be doing is fixing bugs and polishing and adding all that stuff that we've always wanted to add. You know, we all think this, right? Because, <laughs> you know, if you get an extra year, extra month, extra week, it feels like you've got all the time in the world. Well, no, it didn't happen. Basically, we were working just as hard up to the very last minute, and we all the polish that we thought we were adding really was basically fixing bugs. So we had a lot of folks on the team who said, well, wait, weren't we supposed to be polishing? And then we had other people on the team saying, well, fixing bugs is polish. And so we basically came to the tough realization that, as I said before, you're never done. And uh, I guess what it comes down to for us, and I guess anybody, is just scope control and being okay with pushing things out to the very end because we don't want to ship anything that's not awesome. That's and not very, uh, I'm sure that's not very illuminating, but that's what happened to us. <laughs> so. now, now, Matt, obviously with, with a larger dev cycle, um, but also with the added complication of having a new technology that you're actually working with, 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 with id Tech 5. I mean, did that new technology sort of mandate a, a long cycle or was that sort of a luxury that, that you guys just indulged in? Well, we do have a luxury. It's, it's kind of a combination of all those things. Uh, we've been relatively successful in the past, so um, we get a little freedom there. But we've also gone through not just a brand new kind of disruptive technology. Um, we've also gone through an acquisition, changing publishers, growing the team from 20 core developers to now 200 multiple teams. You combine all that together, and it takes a long time. We had some stops and starts. Um, and that, that's why looking back and when you kind of do the post-mortem and you look at what went right and what, was wrong, what went wrong, the things that went right are the things that have always gone right. And that goes back to, you know, having these really creative, talented people and allowing them some creative freedom within some bounds. And now I think moving forward, the job is, um, you know, how do we keep that but get that schedule discipline? And, and what do we need, you know, moving in the future to have those, those dev cycles be a lot uh, shorter? So, so we have a lot of excuses, but it doesn't mean... Uh, that, that we don't have to get it right the next time moving forward. Even it is still learning. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and Mark, it, it, when, when you guys started out, I mean, especially when you're self-publishing, you know, you really have to make a pretty strong case as your product. And, and you're using the, the PC platform, which, which complicates things as well. I mean, sure. what was kind of your strategy and philosophy as you're making League of Legends? So like, okay, we need to get it out there, but we also need to get it out there in a certain type of quality. How, like, how did you manage that discipline? Sure. Uh, it was a very difficult balance for us, and um, you know, we part of the, the challenge with self-publishing for us was also we had to build our own uh, enterprise software, scalable back-end technology and platform to support you know hundreds of thousands of simultaneous concurrent users, which is not an easy task. Uh, then we also had to build our own website, and you know that was actually interacting with our platform and had portions where it was interacting with the game, and so lots of different challenges. Um, but from our perspective, we kind of took a a page out of kind of the web services model, which tends to focus on minimum viable product. Uh, and for us, that doesn't mean that that's not high quality. It just means that we really focused our scope to identify what were the most important problems to solve for our players that would deliver the most fun, and then really make sure that we deliver those experiences and make sure that they were absolutely fantastic to try to achieve our goals, and then get live feedback from our players, see what's working, and then continue to iterate from there based on what our players wanted to see, or the very long list of additional things we thought could add value. Uh, in, in, in terms of, I, I believe it's called d design creep. You know, you have this great idea, you want to put something in there. And I, I, I think that's also a factor of the fact that, you know, that, that, that need and that desire to, to innovate from one version to the next, even if it's something that's, that's in the same franchise. And I was curious, especially for, for Ted and Vince with your experience, when you had that, that, that narrow cycle, how, when do you know, hey, we can get this new innovation in our game? And when do you say, like, hey, you know what? We've got to go back and do something a little bit closer to what we did before if we're going to get this out on time. If, if one of you wants to take that first. Two weeks before launch. <laughs> <laughs> that's why that's what we, on, the, on the old Ratchet games, uh, I remember we redid our last boss in the Ratchet game, I think a week before our final gold, where we had to ship it to the factory. We just totally ripped it apart and redid it. Mostly because it just it wasn't working. And I think we did the same thing on Ratchet Deadlocked. Uh, so 
I don't think it really matters. Unfortunately, it does matter when it comes, but it, these innovations can come up at any time. And I think part of the challenge and, and part, part of if, part of the su a successful game is being able to adapt to those innovations and integrate them and build in enough time to, to put them into your project whenever they arise because ultimately they'll make it better. And if you really, if you plan things out, and if your team can react quickly enough, then ultimately your game's gonna be better. But we've learned the hard way that if you, if you put the kibosh on those, if you say on this date there will be no more additions, then you're, you're kind of setting yourself up to fail. Of course there is a, there is a limit. The day before gold probably isn't a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to co-op now, that's gotta be it. <laughs> I think there's something too to the the team has to understand that there is a cost when something changes or when you add something in something there's not it's not magical time you I mean you have a set amount of time a set amount of hours you can work something will push off the bottom of the schedule they need to know that they need to look and say okay well this new thing that I want to add is more important than that feature on the bottom of the list so it's a good trade let's do it yeah now now what if it's like a core feature like let's let's say hey this time we we want to go co-op in the campaign you know, there's, there's got to be a point where it's like, hold on, yeah, this, 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 this may not work. I mean, that's got to be... That's a balancing act. I mean, that's, yeah. that's where you're kind of, you're asking to upend the whole apple cart. And you know that won't work. I mean, it is really just, you have to rely on your, your creative directors, your, your lead designers to understand, as Ben said, what the costs are. Because there are some things that are just going to completely destroy the game structure. Um, Mark, with, with, with something that was a brand new franchise, you know, it, it, it didn't have this history to make that case. Um, how do you keep the team excited to have confidence in it? Because I, I, I look, I know how I'm like, I get really anxious about stuff and I'm just doing a half hour show. When you're working for two or three years on a game, I think the self questioning would just be devastating. And like, you know, it's like, hey, no, this is going to be good. We're going to find an audience with it. How, how do you keep that, that, that energy up? Well, Mark Keats, because he's still feature creeping. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yeah, launch for us is the start, not the end, which is, which is pretty interesting as well. So, you know, and that's after, you know, four years of development, I guess three years of development prior to actually launching League of Legends. Uh, so we just had our two-year anniversary being live. Um, and, you know, but I think a lot of it comes down to, to vision and leadership and belief and inspiring the team and getting people excited about the problems you're trying to solve. And, uh, you know, we were fortunate in that, you know, we believed we were making an extremely fun game and the team loved uh, the product and really fell in love with it and continues to. And so, uh, you know, per the comment around, uh, launch being the start, you know, we always looked at launch as just the start, and the team did as well. And even to today, two years later, we feel like we're just in our infancy of where League of Legends, League of Legends can go, and which is awesome from both a team perspective. We feel like we can improve so many different aspects of how we do things, but also from a game perspective, we feel like there's so many additional ways to add value to our players uh, that it's really motivating and exciting for the team. And you've, 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 you've really made a, a very, very loyal fan base. And one of the things I, I have to say is, I would say 30% of cosplay at every convention I go to is League of Legends. <laughs> and, and also the, the, the effort they put into their costumes kind of beats the pants off of everybody else. Um, I mean, did, did, did you try to develop that, that support or was it something that sort of came naturally when you realized, hey, we, we, we seem to have hit a chord with people? No, so that was, that was very much one of our goals from, from day one. So uh, as part of this massive focus that we put on our players, uh, we actually invested very heavily on the server side in trying to build a fantastic uh, community department and for us uh, community doesn't just mean you know public relations talking on the forums there's a lot of actual uh, sort of controversial changes we made internally to riot where uh, you know not only do we have a 17 person community team now just dedicated on creating content and interacting with them and whatnot but we actually encourage every single employee at the company to directly interact with our fans and build their own presence and have people follow them on social media and whatnot and there's a lot of risk that we take around information leaks and various things like this, but we think that the return that we generate over the long run is uh, very worth the risk, and we've had a couple of lessons that we need to learn, and, but we just take that back to the team, try to educate everybody about what the goals are, how to get better. Um, but very much, you know, for us, it was deliberate, it is deliberate, and we focus a lot of attention and effort on trying to uh, develop this very close relationship and bond with our players, which we think, uh, you know, is one of the core causes that helped the game really go viral where people wanted to evangelize uh, the product and brand because they loved the experience that we were delivering. Now, Matt, I'm of the mind that if you guys had released a new game and it was called Make Way for the Ducklings, I'd be like, oh, but it's it, I'm playing it. <laughs> and, but, but at the same time, you had a brand new IP in Rage. It was the first new IP since Quake. Um, 
despite sort of, you know, you, I, I think your company's ability to say, look what we've already done, that can, and, and that can have some confidence, I, I assume there's still quite a bit of challenges. Like, hold on, we're, we're moving into new ter territory. It's a game that plays unlike what we've had before. We're doing something very dramatic with the multiplayer. I mean, how do you sort of keep everyone on track? I, I, I can just see all these potential distractions in, in, in there. It, it was difficult. It's difficult for any new IP, even coming from mid. I mean, after 10 years, you have to reinvent and prove yourself all over again. And um, it, it was a difficult process. Again, we started so small, and we went through all these these different kind of studio changes. Um, you know, at the beginning, we, we weren't sure ourselves. And it, it kind of speaks to some of the other questions about, you know, how do you keep the morale high and, and uh, like, how do you keep the team moving forward in a positive way? way and it's really about hitting some early successes and we had that with rage all the way through um so we we had the the, the momentum because we had a successful e3 and then before that we had successful internal milestones and john showed off the tech and you know we did our demonstrations and i think that's kind of important too is just getting some some nice milestones where the team can rally behind it and it, it again it goes back to 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 proving at least on a small scale and then rallying around those things and having them grow um, but for a studio, uh, we didn't do everything right making a, you know, with the new IP. I think we took on probably too many different goals. I think there's about three different games inside of Rage, if you count the vehicles. So uh, we went a little overboard. I think we were so, exciting about do so excited about doing something new, we just did everything. Um, and, you know, moving forward, we may want to scope it back. We did kind of halfway through the project started looking at, the successes in Rage, and they were all on the shooter side, because that's what we did, that's what we love, that's what we always do, that's what the engine's built for, the fundamental controls, 60 frames a second, and we eventually started embracing that and moving back toward what we do mm -hmm. best, because it is important to, to <coughs> pick a direction and stick with it. Um, obviously, yeah, getting to show that game you know, and getting that reaction, I think, uh, really can energize a team. Vince, um, once that happens, though, the cat's kind of out of the bag. And, with, with, with something like Call of Duty, especially, you have that very strong fan base, and the internet starts talking. I mean, that's that, that, that's where I can see problems could emerge because then your employees have that endless twenty-four hour flow of people's reactions <coughs> on, on on message boards and stuff like that. I mean, is is is, is, is there some solution to get people to stay focused and confident in what they're doing and not letting all that external noise kind of affect them? Um, I think so. I mean, we're really excited about what we're working on, and there's you know some teams come up with great ideas, so we're finally finally getting to a point where things are starting to focus in on something that, you know, we can see mm -hmm. kind of an end to, so and, and that, that's what gets people excited, that, you know, the possibility right. of what there's in front of them, what they're doing, some, you know, things, exciting things happen. So. Do you have a kind of a gamer in mind when you're designing a game? Is there, like, you know, just like, okay, it's, it's this type of person in that, you know, maybe the team kind of builds the game with that person's taste in mind, or do you, you know, or, or is it also, hey, we're just going to make what, what we think is good, and we're just going to assume there's someone out there that's really going to like this? Yeah, I like to, I like to make games that I want to play, but, uh, I mean, you try to think about it in terms of, I mean, we have a pretty diverse collection of gamers at the studio that play all different kinds of games, so, you know, the more you can kind of, the more you can hit, even within the studio, I think is a good selection of what gamers are in, mm -hmm. the, in the real world, in the wild, so. Getting feedback internally is a good kind of cross selection. Now, I, I, I guess I, I, this, this this comes to the part where you know, with, with with those gamers, you can sort of get them excited. You know, they they can turn on you <laughs> without you necessarily expecting it. I mean, I, I think some of the things that have really kind of caught me off guard sometimes is how dedicated servers can become. Like, it's it's, it's like it's, it's like the Soviets, you know, having a summit with the U.S. All of a sudden. I mean, are are, are, are these things that run the risk of becoming, of, of overwhelming and eclipsing the game because of just how the internet tends to treat that? And is it something that, you know, can become distracting for the teams that you have? I mean, if, if not dedicated servers, then, you know, what, what one of those things is a game's close to launch? I'm Ted, I'll start with you. Sure. I mean, I think that for Resistance 3, we had, we had some issues going into our beta, and we had some very vocal, hardcore players who were uh, insistent that certain things be fixed and that, you know, the game... <laughs> play a certain way and so it was it's tough for us to see that stuff but it's important and our community team is there to answer the questions and to try to help uh, be transparent as I think you guys were talking about uh, with the players and one thing we just did recently was we uh, we gave control of the multiplayer game to the players 
we now allow the Resistance 3 players to tune the game by voting on what they want to do with the weapons, on what they want to do with the game modes. And this is something we just instituted, and it was kind of our way of saying, hey, we hear you. Um, we, we, this game is for you, so you guys you know, tune it the way you want, and let's see how it works. Now, d does, does this also run the risk that if you listen too much to that fan base, that they can actually lead you somewhat astray, that, you know, this guy's like, no, we, you, you need to have dragons in the next resistance because dragons are the coolest thing. And that, oh, no, crap, we, we have dragons in our game now. We shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just say one more thing. I think that it's, it's really down to, it's important to have a seasoned community team who, who, can, who know who are your uh, kind of balanced, who gives you balanced <laughs> feedback and who doesn't. Because there are, we certainly all have our favorites on the forums who will who are, have one thing in mind, and if you don't change that thing, they're going to come over and do something awful. Um, and always listen to, to the guy in all caps. That's yeah, that, that's because exactly. because he's he's writing the loudest. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, I think uh, to that point as well. Uh, you know, we look at some of the, the direct feedback that players are giving us on the forums and whatnot as as one data point. Uh, and you know, we also play the heck out of the games ourselves. Uh, we also try to look at other data points, you know, in measuring analytics and whatnot to try to figure out, again, to validate the assumptions and to just confirm that our players are what players are saying is happening. Is this really what's happening? Is there something else that's occurring? And oftentimes we end up sharing some of that data with players as well where perception may not be reality. Um, and so, you know, we have found that one of the best ways to help change player perception is actually share some of that data with them and explain what's happening. And then oftentimes, you know, just have a dialogue to demonstrate that we're listening and want to collaborate with them to find other solutions. And uh, we found that's been pretty f effective for us. Uh, what about the press? <laughs> um, obviously, that's one of the easier conduits to kind of get information to the fan base out there. But I was going to just ask, you know, reviews can be a problem, I can imagine, that, you know, you can start to, I can only imagine the way that you would anticipate, oh, God, someone's going to say this about this. And like, how do you try to keep that a little bit separate from the team and insulate them from what you, you, you fundamentally will not have much control over? And I'll, I'll, I'll start with you, Matt. Yeah, that's difficult, too, because it, it, that starts getting in the, on the side of uh, marketing and ultimately sales. And we would like to think, as, uh, on, the, on the creative side, that we ignore all of that. But it's, it's, it's real. It's, it's pressures that the, the team has to face, at least ultimately. Um, and, and a lot of times... You know, the, the critical reviews are going to come after the game is done, and there's little you can do about it. You can learn from what people say, and it does influence directly. I think a lot of gamers have their, their picked sources they trust. Um, you know, they go to these guys because they review games just, just like they would. At least that's what I've noticed. People have. I'm, I want to know what this, this, you know, the A, B, and C think, and, uh, and they, they, tr they give a lot of trust, and it does directly affect the bottom line. Um, so it's a difficult thing. And... There's, there's no magic, um, there's no way to hide that. It's gonna come out, it's, it's gonna happen. Uh, and and it's, I, I think it's all about leading up before that, that ever happens. It's, uh, sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a shame how powerful that is because it does influence everything. I mean, we have a little more luxury with our relationship and our successful past, but a lot of developers probably, if they don't have critical success you know, right off the bat, then it's going to affect their future very directly. And do uh, you think sort of just, I don't want to say emotionally, but kind of like, you know, for the morale, or it's going to affect them just financially in their relationship with, 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 with publishers? Financially, and their ability to be creative and, and have any leverage to say, I want to do this in the next game, and then it stifles creativity and innovation, and then all of a sudden that next little leap is, is constrained, and they can't be as flexible as they would like to, because you have to, you have, to have demonstrable successes to get any leverage to convince anybody that's going to give you tens of millions of dollars to do a project. That's just the bottom line. And it makes sense. It, if I had tens of millions of dollars, I'd want to know what I'm risking that money on. Um, but there are games, and, and you could point to, I mean, just right off the top of my head, the, the first Assassin's Creed, and the average Metacritic was an 81. But that was a fantastically innovative game, at least in some respects. It was doing things that were brand new. So. Even the critics don't necessarily get the franchises. Right. No, sometimes they don't. <laughs> it's, it's definitely an interesting dynamic. I certainly don't have all the answers to how to. Yeah, I mean, Ted is, is the genie out of the bottle on this. I realize, I man, I might be into an area that some of you guys want to pull back on. I completely appreciate that. But if anyone else had a Metacritic comment you want to throw in there, I think Matt said it great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Matt.
Um, anyone who doesn't know my feelings on Metacritic, just type in the F word, Metacritic, on YouTube. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so we are, most people are pontificating that we're coming to the tail end of a technological cycle, and that maybe 2013, 2014, maybe on the outside, 2015, we're going to see some new consoles. Um, that has got to be a challenging moment when you're making that transition because you have a lot of learning that has to start happening. And you're probably, from what I've gathered over time, you're learning on a piece of technology that it itself has not been, kind of, it's, it's not hard and fast what's actually going to be in that. Um, Ted, you've been through enough of these cycles. That, uh, it's, I mean, do you start stealing yourself now for the, for the inevitable down the line? Yeah, I think this time we, we took the approach that it, halfway through this cycle, we decided that we needed to start from scratch with our technology. Mm -hmm. And really, we had been working on technology that was really in existence during PlayStation 2, and we had kind of upgraded it when we went to PlayStation 3, but we knew that we had to start from scratch in our tools to really increase the amount of time we had to innovate, which meant decreasing iteration time. And so we began that effort a little while ago, and our new um, Overstrike game is going to see the advantages of that new tech. So it's been somewhat platform agnostic in that we're not looking ahead specifically to the new platforms. We're just preparing for whatever hits next. And I, I have to say, I think that when we look ahead to the next few years, it's not necessarily about the new console platforms. It's about everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this market has blown up in terms of the number of platforms that are available to, for, uh, for AAA experiences, whether it's the iPad, the PC, the consoles, you name it, it's just tons of opportunity out there. So we can't just, I don't think we can be narrow-minded anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think it's a good idea? I, I know, Ted, you've done this, and forgive me if I've just forgotten that, you know, I think that before. Should you be launching a new IP with a new piece of technology? Because it's always struck me that, you know, as you're trying to get your head wrapped around of how to work this, is that when you want to actually Kind of like, hey, look, it's something brand new when you're trying to get that, 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 that loyalty. I mean, is there any philosophy that you guys have ever discussed about matters like that? Ted, if you want to come in, or Matt, or... <laughs> I think it's a good idea. We did it. <laughs> yeah. For us. I think it's a good idea, yeah. Um, as Ted was also mentioning, yeah, the, the landscape is changing dramatically. And, you know, we're even... Social games used to be this thing that stood lateral to sort of the console games that we all play and we make. Uh, but now the two seem to be integrating more, and there seems to be a lot of market pressure, and I think just sort of interest in trying to do that. Um, is 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 it tough to get guys? Or look, we're, we're for five dudes that like playing shooters and RPGs to kind of say, like, hey, we need to kind of get some of that Farmville thing in here as well. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I assume it, it can be a little challenging. Um, I'll, I'll just start with you if, if, if this is even something that that you're dealing with. You know, I think that. Uh from kind of an outside perspective, you can look at some of the things we're doing at Riot and say that there are some similarities with social games. I mean, in particular, the business model being free to play and selling virtual goods. 100% of our revenue actually comes from virtual goods. Um, but, you know, I think one of the big differences is the customer that we're targeting. And, you know, for us, we're trying to create great experiences for enthusiast gamers who play games, you know, dozens of hours a week. And the expectations that they have are far different than oftentimes expectations of a, of a player who wants to go consume social games. Um, and so that, thus, we think has a lot of implications on everything that we do, from design decisions to business model decisions to how we should reach the players to the platforms we should use uh, to reach them, et cetera. And, uh, you know, but it is something we actively think about and talk about. And the team, uh, at least, you know, the team uh, at Riot has been really open and receptive. And uh, I think a lot of it is because Riot is kind of a bit of an interesting organization that we're kind of a game developer meets game publisher meets a web services company all rolled into one. And so there's this interesting kind of appreciation and cool discussions that happen uh, from these different perspectives that help lead to uh, you know, what we do in League of Legends. And we think that we're really, as an industry, just kind of scratching the surface for uh, all the great opportunity that's afforded by some of this, uh, you know, the great platforms and you know, the circumstances that Ted was talking about that are uh, you know, happening right around now. It's an exciting you, time. Ted, you, you are in the social space. You, you know, that's, that, that's, that's been announced. I mean, what, what do you tell someone who's been working on resistance? Okay, now you've got to figure out a way that you can <laughs> sell some goods at market in a virtual world. <laughs> well, I think, I think the first thing we do is suggest that people play Facebook games, really, yeah. or any kind of social game. Facebook, iPad, iOS games, just because 
for those of us who have been in the console world for so long and hardcore players, it's it's sometimes like getting a glass of cold water in your face. You just realize, oh my God, all this other stuff that's out there. And I've personally had a lot of fun playing social games. And I didn't, I wasn't playing any until about two years ago. And a lot of folks at Insomniac have been the same way because we're either so busy with work or we're so busy playing uh, Rage or the latest big, big game that's come out that we just don't have time. But it's important, I think it's really important for all of us to look outside of the traditional boundaries of this business and see what the rest of the world is doing. And so we're trying to encourage that to keep people you know, awake. And see, more importantly too, looking at the social conventions that are, that are popping up all over the place that we can pull from Facebook and casual games. I mean, these games do a fantastic job of integrating friends and making it fun to connect with each other, where we have for almost two decades ignored that on the console side. I mean, Matt, Rageville, is it possible? Sure, that's what we're working on next. <laughs> uh, you know, an interesting uh, uh, note on that, and I, th I think to be innovative, you have to constantly be looking at all of the, the changes in entertainment. But it doesn't mean that every shooter needs to necessarily embrace. Um, some examples would be um, you're watching a DVD and you want to make it an interactive story. You know, people just want to watch a movie. It doesn't necessarily make it right. Uh, just because there's a Sony move doesn't mean we need to integrate it and it makes our game better. There's some rush to, to, to integrate the next big thing. You know, it, it works for the guys that are doing it well, but you, you have to find the right fit. Just because Nintendo came out with this crazy bowling thing doesn't mean every shooter has to try to integrate some new, new uh, control device, but it just does show that if you hit something that, that it can be really successful. But I think the truth is we really don't know. And everything we're doing today, five years down the road, it's going to be completely turned upside down. In 10 years, I don't even know if we'll... We'll know what, what we'll be doing. There'll be some new thing. It won't just be Facebook. There's always going to be that next big thing. But trying to find the magic sauce of integrating all that is very difficult. Totally agree with that perspective. And uh, you know, our philosophy around the different platforms and, and social games and whatnot as well is that you know, we would want the experience to be really relevant and awesome for that particular platform and think that there's, you know, it's important to really think about the psychology of the user and you know, what they want when they're using those particular platforms and then crafting the experiences to deliver to their needs. And, you know, so as an example, lots of people said, let's go put League of Legends on the iPad or things like that. And we just, you know, we don't think that that experience would be as premium or fantastic as our players would expect. And so, you know, but we think there are a lot of really interesting experiences that could be great for mobile or could be great for, you know, other platforms as well. I mean, Vince, uh, in, in terms of, if, if it's not a new form of tech, but just sort of an idea, like, trying to guess, you know, because with, with, with the dev cycle of the game, you, you're, you're kind of making, it's on blind faith, like, I think people can be into this a couple of years from now. Uh, you've been in that position a couple of times. I don't think I would have ever believed that World War II could have captured the imagination of so many young people. And, uh, you know, I, I think it hadn't even crossed my mind, the idea of doing conflict in a modern or, or near modern setting. I mean, is, is, do you think that you have that, that, that there is some role of intuition? Do you guys have to play some some role of sociologist to to get a sense of you know what are people going to be into? I think it just comes down to the experience. I mean, if something is fun, the setting is almost irrelevant. You know, in, in most cases, some people might turn them off, but for the most part, it's you know you're looking for the, the game is supposed to be something that draws you in, makes you escape, makes you kind of believe what you're playing, and, and you know, I think if you do that, the setting really isn't doesn't matter that much. So it could have been Call of Bunnies. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. No, I think it really could have. Well, um, everyone, I think we are out of time. I would like to thank my panelists for offering me one of the greatest panel lineups I've ever had <laughs> in me moderating. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And thank you to all of you for uh, sitting and listening to these four fascinating, fascinating yeah, gentlemen. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.